Good evening. I very much appreciate being invited uh, to speak about George Horton and Orchidae. Heartfelt thanks uh, to the uh, Maliotis Cultural Center, uh, to the Center for the Study of Hellenism in uh, Pontus and Asia Minor, and the Modern Greek Studies Program. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the gentle American, the real George Horton. George Horton was an American diplomat in the Ottoman Empire who witnessed the Christian genocides in Asia Minor before, during, and after World War I. He also was present during the barbarous destruction of Smyrna by Mustafa Kemal's uh, nationalist forces in 1922. <coughs> Horton, described these events in reports to the Department of State and in his book, The Blight of Asia. Turkey's national policy is to deny culpability for the Christian genocides described in Horton's book, so pro-Turkish authors have disputed Horton's testimony and attacked, him, uh, attacked his reliability. Therefore, as a prefatory remark, I want to emphasize that modern scholarship vindicates Horton. It has demonstrated beyond any doubt that he told the truth about what he witnessed. Just one example, the 2019 Harvard University Press History entitled The 30-Year Genocide substantiates all the major points Horton made with extensive primary sources from the national archives of all major countries involved, including Turkey. You can find more details on how modern scholarship demonstrates Horton's accuracy in our article entitled George Horton's Truth on Genocide and Smyrna and Why It Matters. It is free online and documents what you will hear this evening. With that, let me preview tonight's presentation. First, I want to introduce George Horton. Second, I will use his insights to correct historical misconceptions. Third, I want to share three important life lessons from Horton's life. And finally, in closing, I want to suggest why all of those issues are relevant for celebrations of Orhi Day. So, who was George Horton? He was born in 1859 before the Civil War to Bible-believing parents. He excelled in the classical education they gave him, including ancient languages. At age 14, he entered the University of Michigan, majored in the classics, and took honors in Latin and Greek. He was voted his class poet and graduated at age 18 with a degree in pre-law. He never pursued his dream of a career in law and politics because his father torpedoed his career and annulled his first marriage, both on religious grounds. <clears throat> Horton's father so alienated him from church that he refused baptism and church membership until late in life after both parents were deceased. Horton broke away from his parents and moved to Chicago with nothing more than his college diploma, eight dollars in his pocket, and a valise full of his poems. He took a job as a cab reporter. Within five years, he became a nationally known poet and editorialist, and then he was appointed as the American consul in Athens, in Greece. He did not take it easy in Athens. He immediately learned modern Greek, and within five years, he was published, he had published books in both English and Greek, making himself a best-selling author and internationally respected poet and Greek ethnographer. His book in Argolis earned him a reputation in Europe and America as one of America's foremost experts on Greece. His epic poem, Aphroesa, won rave reviews in England, where he was compared to Keats and Tennyson. After a change in presidential administrations, Horton returned to Chicago and continued his successful career as a major figure in what became known as the Chicago Literary Renaissance. 
Horton most likely would have remained in Chicago his entire life, but fate had something else in store for him that cost Horton his entire family. Eventually, he rebounded and moved to the nation's capital where he earned an honorary doctorate. Then he re-entered the foreign service and returned to Athens when he married a Greek woman. Shortly after that, in 1909, he was assigned to Salonika, a major city in the Ottoman Empire at the time. In brief, that is how Horton became a witness to war, genocide, and ethnic cleansing. He had the soft heart of a poet and the critical eye of an accomplished journalist and academic. In other words, he was sensitive, but also sensible. His superiors in the Department of State lauded his reports, ob observing he, quote, furnishes the department with all the information which he can secure and presents both sides of every case. Inspections of his Smyrna consulate noted his, again their words, exceptional gift of reading the Greek and Levantine character, and businessmen praised his good relations with Ottoman authorities. As World War I ended, the director of the consular service said Horton had, quote, a great and abiding reputation as one of the best men in the service. We should also note that Horton, despite his father, was an ecumenical Christian who took Christ's teachings seriously. He provided for his impoverished parents in their old age and repeatedly initiated aid programs for the less fortunate. For example, in 1912, he mounted a relief effort for Muslim refugees from the Balkan Wars. During World War I, he aided Jews persecuted in Smyrna and helped Jews left homeless by the Great uh, Fire of 1917 in Salonika. He was instrumental in bringing the Red Cross and YMCA to Greece and facilitated their good works, which saved hundreds of thousands of lives. He intervened many times to assist incarcerated or hurting individuals, regardless of their race, creed, or color. We provide a long list of such cases in the index uh, to our biography. It is quite extensive. With that background, let me elaborate on what Horton saw, said, and did in the Ottoman Empire. First, he advocated for American engagement. As World War I ended, he exhorted Americans to secure the peace and reject isolationism. He did this in his poem, Democracy, published in papers across the United States eight months before the war ended. After the Mudros armistice, he championed an American mandate for Turkey, as did many Turks and Greeks. Horton repeatedly warned the Department of State about the need for security. Even before the armistice, he sent cables explaining Turkey's genocide and ethnic cleansing were ongoing. After the armistice, he sent cables encouraging US leaders to make security part of their peace plans for the region. He warned them that despite losing the war, the Turks continued to persecute Christians who needed protection. Assigned to Smyrna from Salonika after the war ended, Horton explained what really happened when Greek forces landed there in May 1919. Horton highlighted the premeditated Turkish ambush of the Greek troops and the indifference of allied military leaders on the scene. He predicted that without staunch allied support, the Greek presence would be a catastrophe that would bankrupt Greece. When that happened and the Greek front collapsed, Horton helped countless Christians to safety. He hit some, including a wounded Greek Evzon soldier and a little Greek girl on an American merchant ship in Smyrna's harbor. He also asked the American warships, uh, for American warships humanitarian aid and requested permission to negotiate a peaceful transfer of the city. 
He was the perfect person for such a mediation effort since he was trust, trusted by both Greeks and Turks. Unfortunately, President Harding and Secretary of State Hughes ordered Horton not to mediate. Most importantly, Horton repeatedly countered Admiral Bristol disinformation. Bristol is a key figure in this sad saga. Although a military man, he was made the senior US representative in Turkey. Along with his friend, Alan Dallas, later the first CIA director, who in 1922 was appointed the Department of State's lead official for the Near East, Bristol pursued his goal of obtaining access to Turkish oil. He considered oil a strategic necessity for the US Navy and went to great lengths to ingratiate himself to the Turks. He manufactured false reports denying Turkish atrocities, doctor accurate reports from others, punished his officers for telling the truth and tried to intimidate subordinates into changing their testimony. He repeatedly reported the opposite of what was happening. When exposed, he made excuses and undaunted, he moved on to the next lie. Admiral Bristol was malevolent as well as deceitful. He argued repeatedly that Turkish Christian victims should not resist being massacred because it irritated the Turks. He also refused to assist the evacuation of 60,000 Armenian orphans. Yes, you heard right, ladies and gentlemen, he did that. Bristol wrote in his diary that it was better to sacrifice those children to prove that the Turks could be trusted to treat the minorities nicely. The mind-blowing inequity in what finally turned the US uh, missionary leaders against Bristol. They demanded that Bristol be replaced. The British and Greek governments did the same, but it never happened. The great irony is that all Bristol's skullduggery in pursuit of oil was futile and not even needed. The United States supplied all its oil needs from its own burgeoning domestic sources. One night, one might actually say that he sold his soul for nothing. Although Bristol never obtained Turkish oil, he did convince many that Turkish atrocities were a myth. I believe he almost single-handedly doomed any chance of American or allied intervention to stop the slaughter in Asia Minor. At a critical moment in history, a few people in the Department of State, Bristol, Allen Dallas, and Horton, guided American policy for better and for worse. Horton's struggle with Bristol and Dallas was quite consequential, as several specific examples illustrate. In Smyrna, Bristol and Horton fought over evacuation of naturalized Americans. Bristol's warships were the only means of evacuation which Bristol opposed. He argued Kemal's forces could be trusted to be on good behavior. Horton knew the opposite was true. The Turks did not recognize naturalized American citizenship and Horton knew those Americans were in grave danger. Because of Bristol, Americans died in Smyrna, many of them horrible deaths. But after an 11-day ordeal, Horton finally prevailed and forced the evacuation. Another example concerns humanitarian assistance. Following the destruction of Smyrna, Bristol, with the help of Alan Dallas, made it official US policy that there will be no US humanitarian assistance, either public or private, for Greece or for any of the millions of refugees fleeing there. If that policy had remained in place, many of the estimated one to two million lives saved by American aid would have been lost. 
vehement complaints from Horton, American diplomats in Athens and Christian leaders convinced Dallas to reverse the policy. The most consequential clash between Horton and Bristol was over American intervention. In early November, as the burned ruins of Smyrna smoldered, Kemal decided to eliminate the remaining one and a half million Christians in Asia Minor. Britain asked the United States to join in an ultimatum to Kemal. American civic and religious leaders were also clamoring for American intervention. The British ambassador increased the pressure by arguing truthfully that the United States would determine the outcome. If the US sided with Britain, France would have to do the same and Kemal would be forced to stop the ethnic cleansing. So Secretary of State Charles Hughes and President Warren Harding reconsidered their non-intervention policy. Dallas prepared them for their decisive meeting with the British, but he did not give them Horton's accurate assessment of the situation, even though Horton was the senior diplomat on the scene and widely recognized for his long record of successful reporting, diplomacy, and predictions. Instead, he gave Hughes and Harding a report Bristol preferred, one which he had cajoled and bullied a junior diplomat to write. It was full of misrepresentations, obscuring Turkish responsibility for burning Smyrna and committing atrocities. Not surprisingly, Harding and Hughes decided not to intervene. Thus, Britain backed down the slaughter continued and the stage was set for a treaty rewarding Turkey for genocide. If time permitted, I would love to relate the five year epic struggle between Bristol and Horton and many others over the Lausanne treaties. Horton worked to get the truth out about uh, the Christian genocides while Bristol and Dallas did the opposite. They covered up Turkish atrocities, promoted fake news, lied to Congress and blackguarded Horton with false reports, hoping to discredit him. In the end, Horton's side won when the US Senate voted the treaty down. Thus, the United States did not join its allies in a disgraceful rewarding of mass murder. If in all cases Horton had prevailed, things would have been much better for millions of people. The converse is also true. If Bristol and Dallas had prevailed in each instance, many, many refugees in Greece would have perished and the United States would have disgraced itself. Beyond all that, the Horton-Bristol struggle had other implications. Germans took notice of how Turkey had forced the Allies to accept genocide and even rewarded with the Lausanne treaties. So when the Nazis came to power, they explicitly embraced the Turkish model of genocide and used it to exterminate Jews and many others they consider undesirable. With that overview of Horton's record in the Ottoman Empire, let us examine specific historical misconceptions about the Asia Minor debacle that can be corrected with Horton's insights. The first misconception is that the Asia Minor fighting from 1919 to 1922 was a Greco-Turkish war. As Horton noted, it was really a continuation of World War I. The fighting took place because Turkish nationalists objected to the armistice and treaty agreements their governments had signed, not because of any bilateral differences between Greece and Turkey. Accordingly, Turkish nationalists fought all the allies, including Britain, France, not just uh, Greeks, Britain, France, and Italy, actually, not just Greeks. Nor was it a war of Turkish independence. Turkish independence was never at stake. What Kemal fought for was territory and to make Turkey a homogeneous Muslim nation. 
Turkey for the Turks and just the Turks. A corollary misconception is that Greek forces invaded Asia Minor, a false claim made by many historians. All the Allied forces occupying small portions of Asia Minor were there to enforce Turkish compliance with peace terms. They were authorized by the armistice agreement and that included the Greeks. Allied forces had the same duties in Germany and other defeated nations after World War I. There was no Greek invasion, period. Excuse me. A third misconception is that Greek atrocities ignited Turkish resistance. That is manifestly false. It is the reverse of the truth. Turkish resistance, which began immediately following the signing of the armistice, predated, predated the Greek arrival by months. Turks refused to return st stolen property and stolen people stockpiled weapons and continued to attack their Christian minorities all in violation of the armistice. It was Turkish resistance that helped convince the allies to send Greek forces to provide security. Indeed, on the very day Greek forces landed in Smyrna at the request of allied leaders, the allied committee overseeing compliance agreed that Christian villagers had to be armed for self-protection. The premeditated and well-organized Turkish ambush of allied forces further demonstrated the reality of ongoing resistance. A fourth misconception is that allied atrocity. Oh, is it back? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I can't see without my glasses that far. Am I in the correct one? Okay. Uh, no, what, three, four? Yes. And then now we should have six, actually. Am I correct? Uh, oh, maybe. No, Miss Cons Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're quite right. One back. Am I correct? Yes. Okay, so it should be this. Yes, okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Can't see with my glasses, cannot see with them or without. Thank you. So a fourth misconception is that allied atrocities were as bad as anything the Turks did. Horton condemned acts of revenge by Greeks but the notion that those incidents were comparable to what the Turks did is preposterous. Horton argued the reckoning mathematically would not be 50-50, not even one to 10,000, his words. The greatly outnumbered and typically unarmed Christian Ottomans were only able to defend themselves on rare occasions and the Greek forces were trying to win international support for their control of the Smyrna area. So the Greeks punished atrocities against Turks, often with a death penalty. In contrast, as the Harvard history I mentioned earlier concludes, Kemal encouraged atrocities against Christians and made sure, their words, the most murderous Turks received the greatest rewards. For all these reasons, it also concludes Turkish atrocities were on a very much greater scale. Okay, it should be slide seven. The fifth historical misconception is that no one knows who burned Smyrna. For three reasons, Horton explained a hundred years ago, it has always been clear Turkish nationalist soldiers burned Smyrna. First, all observers agreed the Turks were in control of their soldiers who instantly obeyed commands. Second, the Turks were in complete control of Smyrna for five days before the fire began. Third, the Turks also controlled the fire they set as a very long list of eyewitnesses of many different nationalities attest. 
For these three reasons, all the in-depth studies of Smyrna conclude that Turks burned the city, something even Turkish authors like Birey Kirli and Fatma Gocek and others have acknowledged. All this bad history, I believe is explained in large part by what historians call hindsight bias. When you know how things turn out, there is a tendency to consider them inevitable. Thus, the interwar years in the Near East are often depicted as fixed by circumstances, as if there was no way to stop the genocides, nor any alternative other than accepting Kemal's nationalists on whatever terms they offered. Well, the truth is the opposite. Kemal's triumph was closely contested and hung delicately in the balance. As the maps on this slide uh, demonstrate, Greek forces only operated in the far west of Anatolia, but they had great success. In Thrace, Ionia, and near Constantinople, Greeks repeatedly defeated Kemal's forces. Until late 1921, when Greek forces alone came within a hair's breadth of defeating the nationalists at the climatic battle of Sakaria in 1921. In a three-day seesaw battle, Greek forces fought uphill against well-entrenched Turkish positions until they ran out of ammunition and had to fall back. If any of the allies had helped supply Greece, it very likely would have gone the other way. Instead, the Italians, the French, and the Russians switched sides early on and supported Kemal with money, weapons, and training. The British and Americans refused to give the Greeks any assistance whatsoever. All this was true, even though the Greeks were enforcing peace terms the British, French, and Americans negotiated. By the way, if you want to read the startling confession of these realities, read British Prime Minister Lloyd George's August 4, 1922 speech in the House of Commons just before the Turkish offensive that doomed Smyrna. He extolled Greek heroism and admitted the Allies prevented Greece from prevailing. There are other historical misconceptions we could identify, but the interest of time, we must move on. What I would like to do now is extract several life lessons from Horton's experience in Asia Minor. The first lesson concerns the value of truth. Government disinformation played a major role in the Asia Minor catastrophe. Where was respected for truth? Was there no respect for truth? How could governments blatantly lie to their publics? Shockingly easily, as it turned out, one might think the importance of truth would be self-evident. Isn't it obvious people cannot make good decisions based on false information? Who wants to board a plane flown by a pilot who does not know or care whether his instruments con correctly indicate the plane is flying parallel to the ground? Isn't it obvious big lies lead to tragedy? An ancient rabbi said, the penalty of untruth is untruth. I believe that aphorism is well illustrated in Asia Minor. The Allies lied about the Turkish genocide and even rewarded it, which encouraged Hitler's big lies and even more genocide in World War II. George Horton revered truth. In 1881, he recited his college graduation poem to his classmates, arguing the pursuit of truth should be one's life ambition. He never abandoned that conviction. Forty years later, and a year before Smyrna went up in flames, he gave the commencement address to the 1921 graduating class of the International College in Smyrna. He told students their life goal should be building up a reputation for truthfulness and honesty, his words. He assured the 
graduates, quote, that the least prevarication is dangerous and not to soil your precious good name, end of quote. He said if one of his subordinates lied to him, again his words, his or her career is practically finished so far as I am concerned. This was not a hyperbole. A 1912 consular inspection report of Horton's consulate in Smyrna noted he was successful in large part because of his uncompromising way of dealing with persons whom he considers dishonest. A favorite Horton saying was the truth will out, which seems a bit quaint now. In our postmodern society, many don't believe in truth. They just believe in narrative, which they see as a function of power. Politicians now lie boldly and even argue it is justified. Is it any wonder that trust in government has declined precipitously? According to Pew Research Center, the percentage of Americans trust in government has dropped from about 75% in 1958 to less than 20% today. Support for open inquiry to help determine truth has also fallen. Speakers are often shouted down and run off college campuses. Even government officials are silenced. My advice, to be like Horton. Adopt an uncompromising position on the value of truth. Realize it is best revealed when both sides of an issue are considered. Understand that truth is not situation dependent. We cannot disparage lying by others if we excuse our own misrepresentations. Cultivate a reputation for truth and demand it from your elected representatives and government officials. Do all this for your own personal welfare, for your organization's success, and for our national survival as a constitutional republic. The Bible tells us the devil is the father of lies and that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is the way, the truth, and the life. Believe it and act accordingly. Another life lesson concerns priorities and the need to focus on what is most important. People often miss the forest for the trees or allow me to mix metaphors, strain at nuts while swallowing camels. One might think people would accord the highest priority to preventing mass murder, but strangely, it's not the case. As Stalin cynically commented, a single death is a tragedy. A million deaths are a statistic. That is how many people react to genocide. As Marjorie Dobkin, the dean of Smyrna studies, observed, Quote, if one child falls into a well, it is a big thing all over television. But if we are talking about hundreds of thousands of people, nobody wants to know about it. Horton encountered the phenomenon. Returning to Washington after Smyrna's destruction, Horton heard time and again that people were fed up with hearing about Turkish massacres. In the first draft of his book, The Blight of Ed Asia, which actually uh, was originally entitled Jesus Wept, Horton commented on hard-hearted Americans ignoring genocide. He tried to bring home the horrible reality by citing an individual example. He described the Armenian couple, babe in arms, walking into the sea to drown themselves rather than endure the fate they knew was in store for them. Later in the book, he offered another example in hopes of reaching his readers. It came from Walter Geddes, an American businessman who worked for a licorice firm in Smyrna. In the fall of 1915, Geddes left Smyrna on a business trip for Aleppo 600 miles to the east. When he returned in November, he went to see Horton in the US consulate. It was already late on a Saturday night. But Geddes was insistent that his testimony be recorded right away. Horton asked his stenographer to stay late and they took Geddes' statement. Later that night, Geddes died in his Smyrna hotel room, very likely murdered by Turkish agents. 
However, it was too late to silence Geddes. Horton sent Geddes' testimony to Washington, characterizing it as perhaps the most remarkable account of a great historic massacre by slow torture that has ever been written. One scene Geddes briefly described was that of a small boy, about seven years old, riding on a donkey with his baby brother in his arms. They were all that was left of his family. The scene made a deep impression upon Horton. In all this infernal panorama, Horton wrote, the one scene that has remained vividly in my mind and which I have often awakened in the night to see is a little boy of seven years riding on a donkey with his baby brother in his arms. Poor little man, I do hope he lived and that he saved his baby brother. Let us be like Horton and personalize genocide in our minds. If you're not sure where to start, consider Thea Halo's moving biography of her mother entitled, Not Even My Name. Sano Halo was 10 years old when she was driven from her village in the Pontic Mountains. She lost her entire family, but eventually made her way to safety in the United States. When your mind is settled on the importance of recognizing and condemning genocide, write to your elected representative and demand action. If humanity cannot agree on something so fundamental as calling genocide for what it is and condemning it, there is no hope for cooperation on less important issues. Our sports heroes bent a knee to protect the death of a single individual, but won't lift a finger to protest mass murder if it threatens their lucrative ties to China. I only know of one man in professional sports, ironically, the Turkish NBA player Enes Kanter Freedom, who courageously condemned human rights abuses in Turkey and the ongoing genocide of more than a million Uyghur Muslims in China. It ended his NBA career, but may God bless and protect him for doing and saying the right thing. The third lesson concerns whether God is still in control of his creation. We cannot help but wonder why God would allow his people to be destroyed and driven from their ancestral homelands. Horton knew this and addressed it in 1917. When the United States entered World War I, Horton had to ev evacuate his American colony from Smyrna. The reverend at uh, Horton's church asked the popular American consul to preach a farewell sermon. Horton was reluctant, but could not say no to the clergyman he admired so much. So he preached his one and only sermon. He acknowledged the world was, quote, passing through a time of great trouble and tribulation, and that great Christian nations are at strife with each other. He asked whether the religion of the Prince of Peace had become a mockery, and if the civilization founded about their religion was bankrupt. No, he argued, adding his words again. Those who say so, and those who in their despair think so, are unworthy of the name of Christians. Further, he told his fellow congregants, quote, being a follower of Christ is an individual attribute and confession of faith and should control the conduct of lives of each of us in times of war as well as in peace. In these dark days and those which may follow, we can let our light shine by enduring tribulation with sweet and gentle courage, by sharing our diminishing cross with those who have no bread, by thinking and speaking generously of those who are ranged against us by administering to the sick, by caring for the, window, the widow and the orphan. He encouraged the congregation to do good deeds with fortitude until the spirit of Christ brought all of his followers into that glorious millennium when the war drum throbs no longer and the battle flags are furled. 
However, six years later, Horton confessed to a period of great despondency and extreme pessimism, weighed down by all the suffering he wrote, quote, the whole spectacle of Smyrna, the great war, the shirking of our obligations after it, and the European and American intrigue and self-interest which made such horrors as that of Smyrna possible, caused me to believe for a time in an actual spirit of evil, who had at last become all powerful and taken charge of the affairs of this wretched world." End of quote. Eventually, Horton snapped out of his depression and followed the advice he gave in his 1917 sermon. He soldiered on doing good as World War II approached. He cared for his family, raised funds for orphaned refugees, lobbied to get Greek metropolitan Chrysostomus of Smyrna canonized, and helped defeat the Lausanne Treaty in the US Senate. Horton struggled with this issue, but I think his advice was good. Haven't we been told there will be tribulations in this world and that God will allow it in order to give sinners time to repent and obtain salvation? I would not presume to explain how God moved in the gargantuan carnage wrought in Asia Minor or during the world wars, but I do think we may discern some interesting patterns all the leading world powers that betrayed the Christian minorities in Anatolia suffered their own tribulations not long after thereafter during World War II. Italy was invaded and occupied and during widespread destruction and the loss of many overseas possessions. France suffering this disastrous defeat, brutal occupation, and then served as a battleground again, again after the invasion of Normandy. As for Russia, well, Russia was invaded, occupied, and suffered horrendous destruction, losing more than 20 million people by most accounts. Britain, which encouraged but then abandoned Greece, was itself abandoned to fight on alone after France fell until, ironically, Greece joined the effort after Italy attacked it. The United States, which professed neutrality, acquiesced to the Allied betrayal of Greece and refused to take a stand against genocide. Still, the United States was the only nation other than Greece to offer large-scale assistance to the refugees. The United States suffered the least in World War II, but its ill-advised isolationist non-intervention policy was shattered by the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. It had to fight a global war for four years, about the same duration Greece fought in Asia Minor. Is God in control? I have no doubt that he is. The world will come to the conclusion God ordains. Meanwhile, we can follow Horton's advice. We can help our neighbor in times of tribulation while holding on to the promise that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed when we meet our maker. So think now about the inescapable choices we all must make when confronted with suffering. Not many of us will be tried the way that little Armenian boy and his donkey was, surrounded by the dead and dying, but still caring for his baby brother. But we can at least try to be as courageous and kind as he was. Well, what does all this have to do with Orchidee? I think it helps us to understand there is a lot more to celebrate on Orchidee than just a single laconic word of defiance. You know the story. In 1940, Mussolini's ambassador told the Greek Prime Minister Metaxas that Italy was invading Greece. He advised Greeks to not resist, but rather lay down their weapons without a fight. Metaxas' pithy response was Ochi, or as some historians uh, recount, c'est la guerre. It was reminiscent of Spartan King Leonidas' response at Thermopylae in 480 BC, and it helped rally the Greek people to a heroic defense. Greece 
threw back the Italians and forced Germany to redirect forces to Greece. Allied leaders believed that changed the course of the war. Stalin said Greek resistance delayed, his words, the German army long enough for winter to set in, thereby giving us the precious time we needed to prepare. Stalin's top general, the British war secretary and Hitler's chief of staff said the same. But here is what I think people often miss about Ohi Day. Many of the men who rallied to defend Greece in 1940 fought in Asia Minor too. Many others who came forward were orphans from Asia Minor and after 18 years in orphanages had come a fighting age. Another connection to Asia Minor was the suffering of civilians. The Greek populace endured horrific Nazi reprisals that wiped out entire villages. The Greek war effort came at great cost to Greece as did the Asia Minor catastrophe. The Nazis and their induced starvation decimated the Greeks literally. Overall, Greece lost 10% of its population, one of the highest percentages of any country in World War II. Where did the first Greek defiance and ability to endure such suffering come from? Was it all inspired by one word, Ohi? I don't think so. The Greek spirit Metaxas called and relied upon is rooted in the Greek character. It stretches all the way back to ancient Greeks. Euripides reportedly said he would rather die on his feet than live on his knees. And Greeks have often demonstrated that devotion to liberty, including modern Greeks. It predated Metaxas Ohi. I think of the Greek women from Suli in Epirus who in 1803 danced off a cliff rather than give themselves to their Ottoman oppressors. I think too of the young Greek Boy Scouts of Aydin, just southeast of Smyrna, who in 1919 were slaughtered and thrown in a well, giving up their lives rather than disparage Greece as their tormentors demanded. There is something else we need to remember on Ohi Day. Why were other countries so greatly shocked by the Greek resistance to the Italians? It was because after the Asia Minor catastrophe, blind to the role of their own countries played, many commentators in the West lampooned the Greeks. US newspapers like the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times mocked the Greeks as the world's worst soldiers. Imagine then the great surprise when the world's worst soldiers defeated the mighty Italian fascists. An astonished world, including Roosevelt, Churchill, Stalin, and even Hitler and the Japanese press praised the Greek fighting spirit. It was not the Greeks who suddenly changed. It was the world's appreciation of the Greek character that changed. To this day, there is sufficient appreciation, uh, insufficient, I should say, appreciation of Greek character and contributions to the West. How many Americans know the Greeks also turned the tide for the Allies in World War I? Most Americans think World War I ended on the Western Front after the United States arrived. Despite rapidly taking hundreds of thousands of casualties, the American army made little progress on the Western Front and the Germans never broke there. This slide illustrates how the war really ended. The Greeks joined the Allies providing nine fresh divisions. They were the largest portion of an Allied offensive staged from Greece. That attack broke through Bulgarian and German Austro-Hungarian defenses and drove 400 miles in less than eight weeks, quite a feat. First Bulgaria surrendered, then the Ottoman Empire, and then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Kaiser was advised to also surrender because they could not go on. Horton was present at the initial attack and at the Bulgarian surrender. He knew it was the attack launched from Greece that ended the war and forced Germany to sue for peace. 
By the way, just to be clear, I realize I'm skipping over the Greek national schism in World War I and the Greek Civil War after World War II and other important events. Greeks usually fight among themselves before doing the right thing and throwing back would-be oppressors. Horton had actually a lot to say about uh, Greek interesting conflict, and that will have to be the topic of another day, I'm afraid. Let's turn now to the Greek military operations in Asia Minor. Bad history has warped popular understanding of what happened in Asia Minor, so much so that many Greeks are ashamed of the Asia Minor catastrophe. The Allies betrayed Greece and the Asia Minor Christians, but they also betrayed the principles they said they fought for in World War I. Among other things, during the Armenian genocide, Allied leaders publicly promised to hold Turkish leaders personally accountable for their crimes against humanity. Instead, they rewarded the Turks for genocide. Only the Greeks made the determined effort to enforce the peace and protect the Ottoman Christians from genocide. Moreover, as Horton observed, the Asia Minor catastrophe highlighted another laudable Greek characteristic. Greeks refer to it as philotimo, love of honor. Americans might translate it as magnanimity or even propriety. The Greeks demonstrated philotimo two ways. First, despite the empty Greek treasury, they accepted all the destitute refugees pouring into Greece, regardless of ethnicity, when no other country would take them in. Citing this reality, Esther Lovejoy, a missionary who helped Smyrna refugees, wrote, quote, the golden age of Greece in art and literature was over 2,000 years ago, but the golden age, age of Greece measured by the golden rule came after 1922, end of quote. The second great act of Philotimo was when the Greeks refused to pay Turks in kind. Horton wrote, quote, the conduct of the Greeks toward the thousands of Turks residing in Greece while the ferocious massacres were going on and while Smyrna was being burned and refugees wounded, outraged and ruined were pouring into every port of Elas was one of the most inspiring and beautiful chapters in all that country's history. There were no reprisals. The Turks living in Greece were in no way molested, nor did any storm of hatred or revenge burst upon their heads. This is a great and beautiful victory that in its own way rises to the level of Marathon and Salamis. In conclusion, I believe Horton's life and insights help demonstrate that we have much more to celebrate on Ohi Day than many realize. We should celebrate the Ohi voice in 1940, but we also should celebrate the enduring Greek character traits that sustained Greek resistance to fascism and made the prime minister's pithy defiance meaningful. We should let the Greek spirit of defiance inspire us. It should encourage us to fight for truth, as Horton did, and against disinformation and those who think that they have the right to lie to us and they were too dumb or servile to know the difference. We should also resolve to safeguard our common history as Greeks and Greek Americans, our common Greek language and our common Greek faith. They form the backbone of the Greek spirit. Finally, we should fight for humanity, not just the humanity of those subjected to genocide, but for our own humanity by refusing to give in to hatred and return evil for evil. Instead, we should do good and have mercy on the afflicted, as the Greeks did after the Asia Minor catastrophe. Let their legacy be our heritage. Thank you very much for your kind attention, and I hope you all thoroughly enjoy your upcoming Ohi Day celebrations. Thank you.
of course. Just a moment. Thank you very much for your compelling and ins inspiring and theological talk. It was really wonderful on every level. I have a question about this final slide. Is there a, a, a book or are there books that you would recommend to describe this, uh, this eight-week offensive uh, in September, October, um, early November of 1918 that, as you said, knocked Bulgaria, Turkey, and Austro-Hungary out of the war? Because um, I've, I've never heard this story before, and I think it's something I'd like to know more about. Well, um, I will have to think about it. Uh, you are absolutely right. It is not really known, and I myself was surprised. I was, as was my co-author, uh, my husband, who uh, is a historian of sorts, and uh, have stud has studied conflicts in depth. And we were both quite astonished. We had not heard that before. Um, it came uh, from um, uh, some of what uh, Horton had uh, recorded. And there were a couple of books, uh, which at the moment, uh, I'm, I want to see if I have them in my slides. I don't think I included them because they were not related to genocide. Uh, so I will have to get back to you on that. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed that. Um, I really appreciate your bringing up the fact that the Armenian genocide was actually used as a model as, and an example for the Germans' own genocides in the 1930s and 40s, essentially saying the world turned a blind eye one time. Why won't they do it again? He turned out to be terribly right. Um, I'm likewise reminded, however, of the relationship you describe between Horton and Admiral Bristol and John Foster Dulles, who on their own end, just several years later, were trying to downplay, to cover up what was happening to the Greeks on the other side of Asian Liner uh, from the rest of the world. I'm reminded of the example of in the Soviet Union in the 1930s between uh, Gareth Jones and Walter Duranty, who himself was reporting on the Soviet Union and was covering up the starvation of the, of the Ukrainians during the Holodomor. The relationship between these two events to me seems very, very interesting. We know that Germany used Turkey as an example for their own atrocities. I'm not sure if, given that these two countries had you know, gone through revolutions of their own, were there any increasing diplomatic or cultural ties between Russia, the, new, the newly formed Soviet Union, and the new secular Turkish state, wherein uh, the Russians could take a play, uh, could take a card out of the out of the Turks' playbook, because the, 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 the similarity between that situation is really eerie. Uh, thank you very much for bringing this up. I am I'm not an expert on Russian history, but I will tell you that uh, the uh, Bolsheviks helped uh, the, the Turks, the nationalists, quite a bit. They were sending trains uh, laden with uh, uh, gold and weapons and in every way uh, they could, as did, of course, uh, the French, who were very helpful uh, to, <laughs> uh, to the Turks and the Italians. Um, so uh, the fact that uh, the, um, uh, the Germans emulated uh, the Turkish uh, model um, it, 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 was, uh, it, it makes us very sad because if we had paid attention and had done the right thing, so many things would have been different for millions of people. Namely, they would not have perished or suffered horrible deaths. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I, I should say something that comes from uh, the 30-year genocide book, which uh, incidentally, uh, I highly recommend it was written uh, by two Israeli uh, scholars who uh, are descendants of Holocaust survivors. And one of uh, their statements is that the uh, Turkish 
genocide was quite more sadistic and the, act, the atrocities, the acts of hate and torturing people and actually trying to prolong the pain and the torture uh, was actually uh, the pain and the suffering was much worse for uh, the victims of the Turks than it was for the victims of the Nazis. And I, I have to tell you, I was very surprised to read that. Um, but they had uh, done a thorough uh, investigation of all the archives that opened up, including the Turkish archi archives, even though they have been sanitized, we might say. Uh, they just keep wherever they want to keep. Um, and um, th that was uh, quite a, uh, an incredible statement. So, but I don't know between uh, the, the diplomatic, uh, uh, what happened diplomatically between Turkey and Russia after that. That's not something I have followed. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture. Uh, I didn't know about the American uh, reaction, the, the, the newspapers. Uh, I was surprised that they were uh, against the Greeks. Um, you mentioned uh, Los Angeles Times and some other. Uh, what was the position of uh, the New York Times? And uh, if you have a, an inkling, what was behind that? Why they were against the Greeks, the American press? Thank you. Thank you. Actually, they were not always or necessarily against the Greeks. They um, uh, reported uh, frequently quite accurately what was happening, the atrocities while they were happening. Uh, but uh, when uh, the, the Greeks lost the war, for, for some reason they, they wrote this, I don't know why, uh, what was behind that decision to publish something like that. But I must say one thing that I believe uh, was and is a factor is the intensity and longevity of Turkish propaganda. Since the beginning, there have been masters at uh, muddying the waters with the help of uh, fools like Admiral uh, Bristol, uh, forgive my expression, but uh, having read uh, his own um, uh, writings and so on, uh, it's, it's hard to, to, to believe that he was uh, a sane person. But uh, in any case, uh, there were always people who uh, were willing to look at the Turkish side and support it. But we have to, to be fair and say that uh, many newspapers across America would accurately describe what was actually happening. There was an outcry. In fact, there was so much of it at times that they said they were fed up. They did not want to hear any more about it. But um, the good thing is that some people, like the missionaries, uh, civic leaders, really kept at uh, reminding people what was happening, as did Horton when he returned to the United States after uh, he concluded uh, his um, uh, diplomatic missions. So uh, I, I, I don't know why they said that, but I, I thought it was very interesting, and then here they were proven wrong uh, at the next uh, war, and I, I thought I would include it. Hi. You spoke about this um, struggle between Bristol and Horton, and I'm wondering, was there kind of Bristol having a personal, personal vendetta against Horton, or kind of a more broader like opposition towards Greek Greeks that kind of harbored um, that kind of stopped him from helping well thank you very much for asking this because um, we have an entire chapter in the book called the war of words uh, about the 
five-year uh, struggle between Horton and Bristol. Well, Bristol, which was, it was not unusual for the time. He was not a diplomat. He was a military man. And he was the high representative of the United States um, in Turkey. But he was a man who did not speak the language. He did not know the culture or care to know the culture. He was actually bigoted. Uh, there is uh, a book, I think, uh, it's called The Great Fire, where uh, it, it states, he, Bristol would say he hated the Armenians, the Greeks, and the Jews in that order. He would say incredible, mind-boggling things that we cannot imagine and do, and he, was, he would blatantly lie. It was not that he had anything against Horton per se, but he did not like to be challenged. He wanted to bully and, and, and punish and bring his uh, subordinates to do whatever he wanted to do. And without realizing it, he was helping the Turks. He was actually pretty gullible. He was not familiar with the culture and how things work diplomatically or in the local culture where he was working. So for example, um, one of his consuls would go and say, well, there are terrible massacres are happening. The Turks are doing all these horrible things in such and such area. And, and this was a, a consul or a vice consul from an area in Turkey. And this is what's happening. He would go to the Turkish minister and Bristol would tell him, well, you're doing all these horrible things I'm learning. Stop them. And the Turkish minister would say, we're not doing anything of the kind. It is the Greeks and the Armenians who are doing those horrible things. And he would believe it. He would take their word for it. So he would go against eyewitness accounts and people who were professional diplomats. And he would always uh, present, write, and he was a prolific writer with his cables to the Department of State, presenting what he wanted to present, which was basically the Turkish propaganda. Thank you. Thank you for such a rich presentation. Thank you so much. And um, I, I um, don't know where to start. I cannot wait to read your book. And uh, I must confess that I didn't know much about George Horton until this evening. So I have a question about his education and about his appreciation uh, for literature. You mentioned that uh, he was an amateur classicist and he was a poet, and I was wondering if um, uh, there is any information about uh, who his favorite classical authors were, or what was his reception of the classics, of the Greek classics? Thank you for asking this question, because I love sharing the story. When he was in school and later studying the classics at the University of Michigan, uh, he enjoyed hunting, so he would go through the fields looking for game, and he would conjugate ancient Greek uh, verbs. I mean, that tells you a lot. And he was a big proponent of classical education. Whenever he could, he would advise young people to study the classics, telling them, including saying that to his daughter Nancy, that if you study the classics, you'll be able to do whatever you want in life. And as um, a, a classical uh, figure that he admired, um, Sapfo, he loved Sapfo's works and he actually translated uh, a fragment of a poem, I believe, and I have it somewhere. I must remember to send it to you. I think you would like that. Um, he just absolutely uh, believed in classical education and um, he, he really um, felt that it was a guiding light for his entire life. 
So he always carried the lessons, the values uh, with him. And of course, his um, attachment to the truth, I, I believe, came from studying the classics. Thank you.